Okay, so let me, you guys, you can come on up. So let me introduce um, Dr. Anjali Sadwani. Um, is a pediatric uh, psychologist at Boston Children's Hospital and an instructor at Harvard Medical School. She is uh, passionate about working with children with complex medical and developmental challenges, and she is the lead psychologist at the nationwide multicenter Angelman Syndrome Natural History Study in Boston. Dr. Wen Han Tan is a clinical geneticist at Boston Children's Hospital as well. He's also the assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard, Harvard Medical School. Um, the focus of his research has been on natural history studies of rare single gene disorders, particularly Angelman syndrome, and he's interested in developing new therapeutics for rare genetic disorders. This is advanced. Hi. Okay. So, first of all, thank you very much to Alison and to FAST for giving us the opportunity to present a little bit of our work. Um, and thank you all for staying all the way to the end. I know this has been a very long day for everyone. You have all heard phenomenal talks all of today on all the therapeutic trials that are coming on. And I think we are all very excited to see all these clinical trials coming um, in uh, 2020. What I'm here to tell you about is what we have done in the natural history study, why this is important, even in the context of having all these clinical trials. So. Very briefly, um, what is a natural history study? And I think you all know this already. So it's basically an observational study. So there are no drugs, no interventions involved. But what is important is that it's a longitudinal study in which we are studying each participant, each child, each adult, every year for a very long time. Um, and this is how we collect data on individuals with Angelman syndrome over a long period of time instead of just over one or two years. So um, the other difference between a natural history study and other studies that you may have seen is that we collect data prospectively, meaning that we ask you questions um, at each visit about events that occurred either at a time or just in the past year. So we are trying to reduce um, recall bias. And we conduct in-person assessment. Um, so you have to go to an individual site, and we have sites across the country. Um, and this will also help us improve the quality of the data that we're collecting. So um, I also want to emphasize that the natural history study complements the global AS registry. Um, we take different approaches. We are trying to answer the same questions. And we get different types of data from it. So the Global AS Registry is very good at collecting retrospective data. And we focus on collecting data that um, can be collected in person, assessments that you hear from Dr. Sawani that we will be conducting in person. And that's a little bit different from what we collect sort of on, through an online registry. So why do we need natural history study? So natural history studies, as you may have heard, are really important for the development of clinical trials, of development of therapeutic products. And I quote from here a um, participant at a natural history study um, conference um, conducted by the FDA a few years ago. And um, it basically said that natural history studies are really important to, because it helps us determine whether side effects observed in a therapeutic trial are really due to Angelman syndrome, in this case itself, or due to the product. So without data from the natural history study, it may be very difficult to know when you see a side effect whether that is part of Angelman syndrome, a manifestation of Angelman syndrome, or whether it is because of the drug. And it also helps, as you have heard today, to um, develop endpoints for the study. And you have heard from Dr. Kakis this morning, and Dr. Kakis at this um, conference a few years ago um, stated that rigorous protocol-driven natural history studies are the kind of data that you can really use in um, drug development. So other reasons for participating and having natural history studies is because it helps all of us as investigators in natural history study learn more about Angelman syndrome. Um, it also helps to build the infrastructure. Once we have natural history studies in place, we have the clinical trials infrastructure, we can launch clinical trials a lot more rapidly because we have the psychologists, we have the coordinators, we have all the infrastructure in place. Um, it's also important to know that you are teaching us. We are learning from you. We are learning from all your children um, about Angelman syndrome. Um, examples of which um, are 
we have learned that through the natural history study that individuals, children and adults with Angelman syndrome um, can be very sensitive to temperature. So they overheat, they tend to overheat easily. Now this is not in textbooks, it's not in, liter it's not in the published literature. We learned about tremors and we learned about anxiety. These are things that until recently uh, were not in textbooks and certainly not in published articles. And it was only because of the natural history studies that we conducted that we have started to learn about these um, symptoms. So the other problem was, um, the other advantage, I, I should say, of natural history study is that we take a large group of patients. We do not control for anything other than having a diagnosis of Angelman syndrome. So we see a wide spectrum of um, manifestations. And again, as I've emphasized, the advantage of natural history study is that we can study um, patients long term. So as a group, we conducted a natural history study um, over an eight-year period from 2006 to 2014. This was the first natural history study on, in Angelman syndrome. And we used a mixture of retrospective um, record review of medical history as well as prospective collection of um, new data at the time. We had annual visits at one of the study sites, and we took in all ages, um, and the criteria basically was having a molecular confirmation of Angelman syndrome. And over those eight years, we enrolled 802 participants. Many of you in the audience were participated in the study, so thank you very much for contributing to our data. And one of the things we learned, for example, was that what we read in the textbooks and what people have thought, what taught us about Angelman syndrome through medical textbooks were actually wrong. So um, you will learn, for example, that you can have normal tone, normal muscle tone um, in up to 50% of individuals. So in children with normal muscle tone, children who do not have seizures can actually have Angelman syndrome. Um, and this was important information that we learned from the study. Um, we also learned about um, differences in their development based on the um, uh, molecular subclass. We also learned that um, there were differences in the, across the molecular subclasses in the different behaviors. Um, and you can see that some behaviors are a lot more common oops, sorry, than um, other behaviors. Now, because it is a longitudinal study over time, we were able to study changes in some of these um, manifestations, some of these um, behaviors over time. So we learned, for example, that anxiety increased over time and some aggressive behaviors also increased over time. And these are data that are important when we are considering clinical trials. We also collaborated with both industry groups, with Roche, as well as with academic groups, with Dr. Ben Philpott's group, to study um, differences, to study the characteristics of the EEG and to determine whether we can use EEG as an outcome measure. We were also interested in the psychosocial impact and economic impact of Angelman syndrome. So we collaborated with different investigators. So um, Saar Peters is a uh, psychologist at, um, at Vanderbilt um, who was involved in the natural history study and they looked at parental stress. And thanks to sponsorship from Ovid and we collaborated with Ovid on the study where we looked at the healthcare burden. What does it cost to raise a child with Angelman syndrome? What does it entail? And this is information that is actually really important for insurance companies because once a, a therapeutic product is approved, we then need to make sure that insurance companies pay for it. And these are data that can help insurance companies um, or persuade them to pay for, um, for the therapies that are being developed right now. So we have also learned through the Angelman, uh, our natural history study that the textbook description of Angelman syndrome is not always what we think it is. And there are, very, there are individuals out there who have very mild um, presentations of Angelman syndrome whom we may not have thought of as having Angelman syndrome. So we identified a couple of families who have a very mild presentation um, due to a, a UB3A point mutation. And Dr. Dewis, um, uh, um, whom you have heard from, um, also present, uh, wrote up a paper and analyzed cases of Angelman syndrome due to um, mosaicism. And what we found was that in all of these cases, they can speak. So these are Angelman syndrome children who actually have fluent verbal speech. 
Um, now, there have been challenges in our um, natural history study in terms of recruitment, and this is where we really need your help. So, for example, we found that most of the participants in our current uh, in the previous study were children, and we had very few adults. So, if you look at this table, only about 11 percent of the participants in the natural history study were, um, at the time of enrollment, were over the age of 12, and only 4% were adults. And this is a problem because it, me it tells us that we do not understand enough about the natural history of Angelman syndrome in adults, and without that understanding, how are we going to develop effective therapies for the adult population, which is so needed? So for those of you who have children and who have you know, adults with Angelman syndrome, please um, come to us. We would really love to study them. We also need people to remain in the study, and this shows the um, dropout rate. So you can see that, of course, all of them came for the baseline study, and then after two or three visits, a lot of them start to fall off. So these were some of the challenges that we faced. Um, we were very fortunate that a couple of years ago, we were refunded by the FDA to start a new um, natural history study. And as part of that process, we went through some of the challenges that we um, had encountered and tried to overcome them. So we recognized that even though we had enrolled 302 subjects in our study, that really represented only a very small proportion of all individuals with Angelman syndrome. So we want to expand our enrollment. Um, we acknowledged that we were not able to commu uh, capture communication skills well. So um, we need to develop new outcome measures. We did not know about anxiety when we first started the Angelman Syndrome Natural History Study in 2006. So we introduced new measures to um, assess that. We also recognized that the Bailey skills of infant development, which you have heard a lot about, um, did not fully um, uh, estimate or do not fully um, tell us about your child's ability. So uh, we needed to think about other ways to assess development. Um, we also realized that have, um, taking kids and putting them in a hospital environment or a research environment to assess their development may not be the best way to assess their development because they tend to underperform. Um, so we need to overcome that. So. I'm going to hand over, um, with these caveats in mind, to Dr. Sawani, who's going to tell you about our new study. So under the leadership of Dr. Tan and with funding from the FDA, we, after a brief period of hiatus, we relaunched the Natural History Study in 2017 to overcome some of the challenges that we had, the following things were done. We essentially engaged with the ASF clinics so that they could be our study site. We wanted to do this to reduce the burdens on the family so they don't have to do multiple visits. So if you're coming to the clinic and if you sign consent, we can use your data for the natural history study. We also essentially consulted with all the stakeholders in selecting the outcome measures. We spoke to the parent advocacy groups like ASF and FAST. We talked to ABOM. We talked to multiple pharmaceutical companies to figure out what outcome measures would be most important to collect data on for their clinical trials. Uh, we in, in introduced standardized measures for communication and anxiety. We noticed that in our past natural history study, there was variation in the way the Bailey scale was conducted in different sites, and so we standardized the administration of the Bailey scales of infant development. We also had an online patient participating port portal for some of the questionnaires, so parents can fill out all those questionnaires online before coming in for the visit. And what we made Sure, is that we realized there's a reduced follow-up rate, so after an initial visit, we could do some of the follow-up remotely through phone consultation. So currently what we're doing is we are all participants who have a molecular diagnosis of Angelman syndrome are welcome to be part of our study. You have to travel to one of the sites for at least an initial visit, and then we can have follow-up visits via the phone. Uh, one of the biggest thing of our study is that if you uh, enrollment in our study does not preclude enrollment in other studies or clinical trials. So in fact, if you are participating in clinical trials, if with the permission of the pharmaceutical com company, we would like you to continue to participate in our natural history study because we want to see how the natural history changes over time. The pharmaceutical companies do, do follow up only for a short period of time, and we want to see how do these drugs change the natural history over time. 
The participation at each visit is about four to five hours. However, the, in, the participation requirement from the child is only about an hour and a half, and the rest of the time is with the parent. Um, we have a booth outside that you can register if you're interested or ca contact our fabulous uh, coordinator. At each visit, we do a comprehensive medical and developmental history. We do a physical exam. The psychologist evaluates your child and asks you questions about their everyday functioning and communication. We have you fill out questionnaires about their communication skills, their behavior, anxiety, sleep, and the stress of raising a child with AS. One of the limitations of this, our previous study was that we realized that children underperform in a high stress clinical pro, uh, environment. And so what we do as part of this new study is we've launched a home video pilot project where we're trying to assess development within the home environment. We are providing individuals with AS an opportunity to, to demonstrate skills which are not apparent in a clinic-based setting. So in a less stressed, comfortable environment, what, how are they communicating? How are they navigating their home environment? How are they eating? So those are skills we are trying to assess through our home-based, video-based project. Currently, it's only being trialed for patients in Boston, but then we hope to uh, expand it to other sites in due course of time. Our study it currently is only open at Boston Children's Hospital and Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego, but very soon we are opening at Rush and UNC, and then Emory Children's Hospital, Aurora, Vanderbilt, Greenwood, and three sites in Canada will sub follow subsequently. We cannot do this study without a village, and so we definitely want to thank all, all the PIs of the different sites, the study coordinators, and the study team at all our different sites. We want to um, have uh, Catherine Merton and Anna Booman come up, who are the research coordinator and research assistant of the Boston Children's site, to just acknowledge the work that they've been doing. We also want to say a special thank you to the sites, study sites at San Diego, Nashville, Greenwood Genetic Medical Center, Texas Children's Hospital, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And last but not least, we want to thank you families for participating in, this, in our study. We have been deeply appreciative of the time and commitment you've given our studies over all these years. And it's because of all of you that we're able to produce this valuable data to help benefit clinical trials. So thank you so much for your help. So Catherine is the lead study coordinator, and both of them will be at the booth um, sometime tomorrow as well. So um, if you have questions, please come up and see one of us. Thank you. Any questions? My voice is done. Well, I was told last year, since we went from 8.30 to 7.30, that I was responsible for torture. But what I want to say is, we are on time, so you're welcome. Thank you everybody for staying. I mean, the fact is there's still a lot of people in this room and I know you're very tired. There was not a lot of break today, um, but it was worth holding your bladder for all the amazing information that we received. Um, so if you have any questions, I'll be around all weekend. Come and find me and I'm happy to translate anything that didn't make sense to the best of my abilities today. Thank you.